So we are continuing this morning in the book of 1 Corinthians, which we've been going through since October last year. Now, last week I began in chapter 10 and we looked at verses 1 to 14. And this afternoon I'll be continuing in chapter 10 from verse 15 going through to verse 33. But I'm going to start with verse 14 in a while as my springboard into the message. So... A brief recap from last week, we saw how Paul, the Apostle Paul, used the history of Israel as a lesson to admonish and warn the Corinthian Christians to, as I called it, fix up and live right, else they would experience a similar fate to that which the Israelites experienced. And that was missing out on entering the promised land. We saw that the first generation Israel Bar Joshua and Caleb were not permitted to enter into the promised land and all died in the wilderness. So Paul admonished the Corinthian Christians to take heed of the lessons to avoid the same fate, not in entering the physical promised land, but missing out on the promises of God and find themselves cut off from him. As previously said in chapters 8 and 9, which Reverend Nathan addressed in chapter 8 and Deaconess Janetta addressed uh, in chapter 9, Paul looks at the issue of eating meat, meat which was sacrificed to idols. For the Corinthian Christians, this was a major concern and one that was very divisive. Here in the second half of chapter 10, Paul will continue to address the subject. You see, in the ancient world, there were two sources of meat. The regular market where the prices were higher and the local temple where meat from the sacrifices was always available and cheaper. You know the bargain meat. Everybody love a bargain, huh? Everybody loves a bargain. But it's not, it's not all bargains that are good for us. But they had the bargain, the bargain meat, the cheaper meat that was from the temple. Now, in the handbook of life, in Bible times, it helps us to understand the situation. So I'm going to quote, and it says, even the relatively household duties of buying meat from the butchers or going out to dinner with friends were brimming with problems. Some butchers bought their produce wholesale from the pagan temple where it had been ritually slaughtered or partially offered as a sacrifice to idols. So the believers in Corinth were unsure whether or not to buy such meat or to eat it if it was set in front of them, end of quote. From chapter 8 through to chapter 9 and now in chapter 10, Paul writes to help the Corinthian Christians to see the problem from a Christian perspective. As I stated last week, the subject of eating meat sacrificed to idols may seem strange in our modern society and something of maybe little interest. However, whilst our issue today might not be that of eating meat sacrificed to idol, there are definitely lessons we can learn from the text and also apply to our lives in order to prevent another brother or sister from stumbling, especially those who are weaker in the faith. So as a springboard then into this morning's sermon, verse 14 says, Paul says, Paul warns the Corinthians to flee from idolatry. To flee from something isn't to walk away slowly or casually from it. On the contrary, to flee means to run and run as fast as you can. Some would say it's to put your foot in your hand and run. I don't know how you can put your foot in your hand and run, but we understand, we understand what they mean, don't we? There's an urgency. There's an urgency. It's an urgency to get away from the situation, to get away from the place, to get away from the person, to get away from the environment and the like. Now, the title of the message this morning is Be Wise for Conscience Sake to the glory of God. And the sermon somehow falls under three areas. Be wise for conscience sake, for the glory of God. So the first part then is to be wise. Now, Paul is going to present an argument for consideration. And he states in verse 15, 
I speak to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. To be wise, the definition of to be wise is having or showing experience or knowledge and good judgment. It means to have the power of discernment and judging properly as what is true or right. It also means possessing discernment, judgment or discretion. Now, the Corinthian Christians prize themselves on being wise people, full of wisdom, much like many in our society today. I don't think any of you would say here today that you are unwise. If I was to ask you, not that I'm going to do that, to put up your hand to say whether you think you are wise or you are, well, what's the opposite of wise? Unwise. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Yes. If I was to ask you if you believe you are wise to put up your hand and if you believe you are unwise or foolish, Yes, put up your hand. Yes, curls, I see you, got you, clock you. Yes, would you put up your hand to say you're wise? Or would you admit that you may be a little bit foolish? Yes, or unwise? Nobody will want to do that because we all believe we're wise people. Yes? So this was the state of the Corinthian Christians. They believed that they were wise. So on this premise, Paul challenges them saying, If you are truly wise, then carefully consider what I'm about to say. So in verses 16 to 21, Paul will address three things. He addresses the cup of blessings, Israel after the flesh, and Gentile sacrifices. Now, the cup of blessings, or as the NIV refers to as thanksgiving, is a name the Jews gave to the cup at the end of a meal, over which a thanksgiving was said. In Holy Communion, there is a participation in the blood of Christ where we drink the wine or the juice or the black currant or the syrup. Yes? In Holy Communion, we receive the cup. We are not drinking the blood of Jesus Christ, Reverend Veronica. We know that, don't we? We're not drinking the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a symbolism of his blood. Amen? So in Holy Communion, we the Christian, we the believers, we partake of the cup, the blood. Hallelujah. And together with the blood, the cup, we take part of the bread, which represents Jesus' body. It is one loaf. That means that when we come together in communion, Holy Communion, drinking the wine and eating the bread, we are saying that we are in a spiritual process, and we are sold out to Jesus Christ. Amen. And we do this by faith. We believe this by faith. Because it's faith that we need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's by faith. Hallelujah. Thank God for, for faith. So we don't literally drink the blood, and neither do we believe that his body is the real living body. It's just a symbol. Hallelujah. His body, his life, he gave up for the world, for you and for me on an old rugged cross at Calvary to purchase salvation and redeem us from sin. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So in eating the bread, we are many, but we are one, as in one loaf. In Christ, we are one. Amen? In Christ Jesus, we are one. Black, white, rich, poor, young, old, whatever. In Christ, we are one. Amen. So there's no need for us to be jealous and envious and all those things that divide us. We are one in Christ. Hallelujah. Now by partaking of this meal, Holy Communion, or it's also called the Lord's Supper, or it is also known as the Eucharist. We are eating at the Lord's table and declaring that we are joined together with him and fellow saints. We are in one 
and I'm emphasizing the one communion with him and with each other. Note, let me note something here. Let me, let me say stick a pin here. In partaking of Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper, this is not something that we are to do and take lightly, haphazardly, flippantly, or ignorantly. For the practice of Holy Communion speaks of unity and fellowship with Jesus Christ and other believers. So then the question I have to ask us as I ask myself, how can we take communion and not speak to each other? How can we take communion and talk about each other? How can we take communion and criticize each other? How can we take communion and lie on each other? How can we take communion and even go as far as to assassinate another person's character and then come and partake of Holy Communion? To do this, the one that is doing this is drinking to their own peril. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 29 says... For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eat and drink damnation to himself. Not to your brother, not to your sister, but you're drinking it, I'm drinking it, we're drinking it unto ourselves. Holy communion is to be taken in love for our Lord Jesus Christ and in unity, oneness with the saints. Paul talks about Israel after the flesh to develop his point. And he says, from the Jewish worship and customs, verse 18, he says, Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? That is, of the sacrifices offered upon it. The idea here is to illustrate that among the Jews, those who partook of the sacrifices were regarded as being one people and worshipping one God. The priests and the Levites who waited at the altar and ministered about holy things there, who bought the sacrifices and laid them upon the altar of burnt offerings, they partook of the altar, of the sacrifices there, and showed themselves to be of the Jewish religion and professed and declared that they worshipped the God of Israel and in so doing would be in communion with him. Paul then applies this same argument against feasting with idols, the Gentile sacrifice. Those who eat of the things sacrificed to idols declare themselves to be idolaters, to be of the pagan religion, to be worshippers of idols and to have fellowship with them. So if you partake of the sacrifices offered to idols and join with their worshippers in the temple, you will be justly regarded as united with them. This is what Paul was saying in their worship and partaking with them in their abomination. Verse 20 of chapter 10 says, The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Let me say it again. The things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And Paul says, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. The problem that the Corinthians had was that they thought since the idols were not real, just wood and stone and metal. It didn't matter what we eat and it doesn't matter where we eat it. But to engage in an environment of worship, going into the temple and eating of that meat in the pagan worship environment is tremendously seductive. You can get caught in a lifestyle that will self-destruct. This is what Paul was trying to say to them. You and I might say, well, we have no intention of going to any idol feasts or bowing down to any idols or getting involved in idolatry 
But what we need to understand is what idolatry really is. Idolatry involves taking something that is created and putting it in the place of the creator God. In our society, there is much idolatry. To be honest, it's prevalent, but often not recognized. The amount of time and money people spend on clothes, houses, cars, makeup, sports, investments, themselves, family, relationships, careers, jobs, and the list could go on and on and on. Now, whilst in and of themselves, these things are not idols. Having a nice house and a nice car and a good job and nice clothes, all those things are not idols. But when we make them become our focus, when we make these things become our drive, when we make these things become the be all and end all of our lives, so we can't go out lady without the weave. I'm going there this morning. We can't go out without the makeup. We can't go out without the jewelry. We are satisfied if we don't have the, the best car. Or we don't have the latest Louis Vuitton or Christian Dior or whatever it is. We make it become obsessive to getting those things. What you and I are actually doing, brothers and sisters, we are making those things become idols. And God says, you shall have no other God beside me. We also need to understand that behind everything and everyone that could be potential idol, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing, it is not a vacuum, but a demonic power. There's a demonic power behind it. Hmm. We don't like to talk about demonic powers for some don't subscribe to such beliefs and even think it's nonsense. And when we talk about demons, we're not talking about necessarily little red imps and a pitchfork and a, and a, and a, and a you know, long tail and blowing smoke. Now, they might look like that, I don't know. But we're not talking necessarily about those kind of demons. What we're talking about are spirits ungodly spirits that are waiting to attach themselves to those who are not watchful. You see, if we're not watchful and vigilant, spirits will attach themselves to us. Let me say it again. If we are not watchful and vigilant, Spirits, evil spirits, will attach themselves to you and to me. Let me tell you something. Satan is alive. He's real. They say he wears Prada. I don't know whether he wears Prada, Dolce and Cabana, Joe, Jupe. I don't know what he wears. I don't know what he looks like. But then black, white, big, I don't know. I don't really care because I want to stay far, far from him. We never want to smell him Kaluan, Joe. We never want to smell him Kaluan. But he's real. He's real. He is real. First Peter 5 verse 8 Amplified says, Be sober-minded, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. The word says, be alert and cautious at all times. The enemy of yours, the devil... Prowls around like a roaring lion. Hmm. What's he doing, Jen? Seeking who he can devour. My God. They say don't have teeth, but he can have gum. But he's going to try and devour you. He's going to try and devour me. He's seeking those who he can devour. We need to be watchful at all times. The pagan worship at Corinth wasn't an innocent brethren. Behind the idols that Paul talked about, although the idol itself had no power, there was a demonic. That is why Paul says, I do not want you to partake or partner with demons. He goes on and he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Brethren, my brothers, 
My sisters, we cannot operate in two camps. When we make a true decision to follow Jesus, the decision does not allow for double-mindedness. It's all or nothing. We cannot serve God and mammon according to Matthew 6 verse 24. And Jesus was saying here, you cannot serve two masters. Now the Corinthian Christians were sophisticated people, not dissimilar to us today. Many of them thought they could have it both ways. In the same way, many think they too can have the best of both worlds. So on a Sunday morning, we have a little bit of Jesus. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, no, Saturday night, we have, we have a lot of the world. Yes, and then we come back into the, the house of the Lord Sunday morning for a little bit more Jesus. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The song says, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and serve him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. When one enlists for the army, I don't know, Brother Alton, I can see you at the back there, Brother Alton. I don't know, Brother Courtney, I don't know where he is, Brother Courtney. He's a, so, so, oh, there's Brother Courtney. Yeah, come, 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 brothers, come up here, quick, 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 quick. Brother Alton, Brother Courtney, come quick, quick, please, quick. I know that Brother Robert is here. Brother Robert's not here, Brother Robert's not here. But I know, come on, come on, I saw you. Take the time. That's true. Let's see fight. <laughs> Let's see warfare going on. Come up, man. Come up. Come up higher. Yeah, veteran. <laughs> now, I'm not an, a, an army person. I don't have a monopoly on the army. But I know these two brothers were ex-soldiers or ex-army men, yes? And I believe that when you enlist for the army, there are rules. If I'm right, just say yes. There are rules. Say amen. I can't hear you. Amen. There are regulations. Strict requirements. I can't hear you. Rigorous training and regime. They cannot do as they please. They cannot go where they please. They cannot eat whatever they like. They can't eat what they like now. But. They cannot wear whatever they please. They have to wear a uniform that distinguishes them as soldiers. Amen? Amen. Stay there. And they cannot go and come as they please. They can't just think, well, today I'm in the army. And you know what? I want to go home. <laughs> you know, I just want to go down the pub. Just want to go and see the wife, Marilyn, you know? Just want to go and check the brethren, them. Just want, to, just, just want to just jump in my car and just, you know, just go. To do so is called what? AWOL. Again? AWOL. You cover? AWOL. AWOL. Tell us what it means. Absent without leave. Absent without. Absent without leave. Without leave. 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 So they have to stay there. Because then what? Them sign up. Them sign up for the army. And you sign up for five years, ten years, I don't know the duration, but you sign up, isn't it? So the army men, the soldiers, they are under what we call heavy manners. Heavy, heavy manners. And so, thank you my brothers, you can march back. Corporal, yes, give them a, give them a hand. Sergeants, thank God for our brothers. And so, it is with the army of the Lord. We can no longer live according to our old nature. Amen. We are signed up for the army of the Lord, Sister Pat. We are signed up for the army of the Lord. Now I don't have to wear a particular outfit. Glory be to God. I don't have to wear no army boots as such, Brother John. But we sign up. For the army of the Lord, Brother Dale, we sign up. And so there are requirements and there are standards for us as children of God to not go AWOL. 
absent without leave, Joe. But many in Christendom, in the body of Christ, I'm not just talking about Harvest Temple, but I'm about the body of Christ. Many Christians are on about, I'm talking to Christians this morning. Many Christians have gone AWOL, they've gone absent without leave. We don't know where them is. They don't answer to nobody. They do what they like. They go where they like. They eat what they like. They drink what they like. They behave how they like. Absent without leave. I'm coming for us this morning. I said, us, us. I'm coming for us this morning because the Lord has given me a word. Hallelujah. We love to sing. Goodbye world. I'll stay. Sing great. Sing it, sing it, sing it. Stay no longer. Come on, come on, come on. I'll work today. Sing. I'll stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Yeah, we love that. Sing it, great. Sing it, sing. I made up my mind what, do to I go dance? God's way the rest of my life. Yes, I will dance, dance, dance. Sing lie. We need to stop singing lies because some of us have not made up our minds to go God's way. We're doing what we like, behaving how we like. We have not made up our minds to go God's way. We have to be sold out for Him. Now, does it mean now, because I'm a, I'm a Christian, does it mean that I have to be cut off from the world and live in isolation? Not at all. No, not at all. We are light and we are salt. In verse 23 to 33, Paul states, everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Not all things built up. Look, my Christian liberty, your Christian liberty is important, but there are some things that we are not to do and we need to be wise about. We have to be amongst our family. We have to be amongst our friends. We have to be amongst our colleagues. We have to be amongst them. Why would we not want to be amongst them? You ever cook without salt? Don't taste very good. We are salt, so we must be amongst them. We are light. One of Debbie's favorite scriptures. You can't put a light on a, on a bushel. We are light. We have to shine in the world. But we are not to take our Christian liberty for granted. Hallelujah. As Christians, we should have a concern for the well-being and the good of others. It's important to promote the best interests of other people, not selfishly seeking of our own interests. This is what Paul was stating in verse 24. He says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Glory to God. Moving on to verse 25 and to verse 30. Paul shows in what instances the Corinthian Christians might lawfully eat what had been sacrificed to idols. He tells them that they may eat meat that is sold in the meat market without asking questions because it was sold there as common food. And as such, they might be able to, they can buy, go and buy it and eat it. There's no problem. You can go and buy it. It's, in the, it's a common food. However, we are to note that it is sinful to use any food in an idolatrous manner. He adds that if they were invited by a friend or heathen acquaintance to dinner, there we go, we can be with our friends and our families and our loved ones. He said, then we ought to go. We are not to avoid being with our friends. We are not to live in isolation from them. But we have to be wise. Paul does not prevent Christians, let me say it, from going to dinner or being amongst unbelievers. 
For after all, like I said, we are light and salt. Second part of my heading this morning, conscience sake, for conscience sake. He says that whatever is offered, they could eat without asking needless questions for conscience sake. Because at a common feast, they might expect to eat common food. So they go into their friend's house, they go into the, the, the banquet, they go into the feast, they can expect that the meat that was going to be there wouldn't be meat that's probably sacrificed to idols, just from the, the cheap meat from the, mar- from the pagan temple, from the market. So he's saying you can, you can eat off it. He says, whatever is offered, they could eat without asking needless questions. However, if at such feasts, someone states that the meat was offered to idols, then they should not eat it. So you're at the meal, somebody says to you, oh, by the way, this meat was offered to idols, then you should not eat that meat. Why? He says, eat not for his sake that showed you and for conscience sake. Don't eat for the sake of yourself, but don't eat it because of the sake of the conscience of the one that told you about it. Because ask yourself this, why would they tell you that it was sacrificed to idols unless they thought it was wrong for you to eat it? So the fact that they've told you this, the fact that they've told you this means that they're thinking, oh, well, she's a Christian. Maybe she's also a woman of God. So let me tell her, let me tell him. So if they've told you this, then do not eat it. You might think it's nothing, but for the conscience of the one that's told you, do not eat it. A definition to what our conscience is states, we can define the conscience as the inner witness that testifies to the rightness or wrongness of our action. Put another way, The conscience is a part of your mind that makes judgments on your behavior. It either accuses or excuses you. It is obvious that the person who would share this information with you as a Christian about the meat would have a conscience about you eating it. They know that this meat is meat that was sacrificed in the temple amongst the pagans and the idols, and they're telling you about this, so you're not to eat it. Paul says, don't eat it. Hallelujah. This means the other person's conscience. We are to take into consideration the other person's conscience. The strong Christian knows that offering me to an idol cannot really alter its character, for the idol is nothing So his conscience is clear. So the mature Christian might think, well, I know this thing is an idol. I know it ain't no, it ain't nothing. It's just a piece of cloth. It ain't nothing. And I know that the meat sacrificed to it isn't going to change its character. So I can go and eat it because you're a stronger Christian. But a pagan observer, one who doesn't believe, thinks the idol is a god and sees the fact that you are eating it as you are sanctioning idolatry. A weaker Christian observer will be in danger of being harmed. If a weaker Christian sees you as a mature Christian doing some things that cause them to question, there are some things that we do that weaker Christians will question and we have to be mindful about their conscience. Hallelujah. Not because we have Christian liberty. We are to do anything. We must not be made the means of an offence to another. Let me say it again. We must not be made the means of offence to another. As a Christian, we should be very cautious of doing what may prejudice the conscience of another and weaker brethren. Hallelujah. But unfortunately... There are some who by their behavior, attitude, lifestyle, selfish pursuits, use their liberty unwisely and some even detrimentally. In the same way the Corinthian Christians were doing. Now I hear you say, well how? How are they doing that? Well, 
It's not in the eating of meat sacrificed to idols or going to the pagan temple, but it's sad to say there are Christians who go out clubbing on Saturday nights, drinking excessively, smoking and having a so-called good old time, where the world is looking on in wonder and bewilderment, especially when we say we are Christians. We sing the well-known chorus. We sang it already, goodbye world. But Christians, when we sing this song, it should be our anthem of truth. Some Christians are indulging in fornication. Some in idolatry. Some in homosexual practices and the like. Yesterday they had the big old march. The Pride March all around Wolverhampton. And this morning as I was praying to Sister Ginetta, the Lord said to me, Mother Jean McPherson, we need to get up. We need to find out where they had that march. And we need to trail and track that march. Because what they did in Wolverhampton, what they do in Birmingham, what they do in all the places that they're doing the Pride March, they're releasing demons, they're releasing spirits in the atmosphere. And our children and our grandchildren, the adults are all mixed up. But we have the power to take back the authority. We need to know where they're marching. And after they go, we go with the spiritual Holy Ghost Hoover and we vacuum the street and over I'm done and we take back we sit down thinking oh it's just pride just pride well yes it might just be pride but our spirits our children are confused the education system is confused the curriculum and all sorts they want to infiltrate our children and we sit down quiet the devil is a liar Yes, transvestites and some, some people are trying them wife underwear and some wife are trying them husband underwear. Some are gambling, yes, going to the bingo hall, gambling online. I'm not even on about the lottery, I'm on about gambling, they're addicted. You were up all night watching TV late at night, watching those adverts that come up about, and they say, the other audacity to say to you, we'll give you 10 pounds. They ain't giving you nothing. They're giving you a demon. When you buy into it, they're giving you a demon that, that attaches itself to you. And before you know it, you get hooked up in the pornography. You get hooked up in the gambling, the shopping, or whatever it is. Some are taking all manner of drugs. Yeah, some heavy drugs too. I need Brother Noel Samuel to help me because he know all the names of them. I don't know them. Some, yes, are involved in Freemason. Obia. The Lawrence. Voodoo. Witchcraft. And all manner of occult. Tarot card, horoscope, crystal ball. Some of you are wearing, some people are wearing God ring. Yeah, and charms to ward off evil spirits. I'm on about Christians doing these practices. Some are so superstitious. Take measure over the door. Yes, I used to ask. When I was a child growing up, I used to see people have to take measure over the door, John. I used to say, well, I don't understand, Nathan, I don't understand why the tape measure over the door and somebody told me, I don't know how true it is, but you're going to tell me, sir, Jane, they tell me, so if this is the, t no, I won't do it. I mean, the house, but you know, the tape measure, you put it over and say you have, it stops at like 30, this side and then like 32 or whatever's on the other side. And they told me that the doppy them the ghosts the ghosts we said doppy the Jamaicans said doppy yeah the doppy them oh, the, go the ghosts they start to count and then count 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 and when they get to where the tape is over the door because they can't see the other number on the other side then the doppy go away <laughs> 
Yeah. Can do, can't coach the other side. Can't see the other side of the tape measure. So he won't come into the room. So if you're in the room, the ghost won't come in. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Eh? Tape measure for run Duppy. You need the blood of Jesus. That's what we need. The blood of Jesus will run any Duppy. Any demon. It ain't no tape measure. Glory be to God. Some have them Bible. They don't believe in God, you know, Joe. Don't believe in God. Don't believe. And I have the Bible on Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And I have it in them baby cot. They have it on them bed. I have it in them living room. Open up. All to ward off spirits. But I come to tell you today. There is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. And the resurrected power of Jesus that can ward off any demon. So if you're struggling with demons and demon is your thing, get the blood and blood up the demon them and blood up the top of them. Blood them up. And stop this wishy-washy foolishness as believers when Christians indulge in such practices and lifestyle, Paul asks the question in verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now hear me and hear me good. I am not really going at the new converts, the new baby Christians. Because they knew they're babies. And so we, the more mature believer, are to walk with them, talk to them, encourage them, guide them. Don't throw them on the scrap heap. They're babies. But I'm talking to we, the ones that have been saved from Wapi Akil fell up. Saved from a long time. We who've been in the faith long time, long time. And Paul says, by now I should be giving you meat, but I still have to give you milk. I'm talking to we, the mature Christians, that are doing these foolishness. We need to stop it in the name of Jesus because we are provoking the Lord to jealousy. And Paul says, we cannot eat or drink of the Lord's table and the table of demons. This applies to the church of God today. We cannot mix such practices with being Christians. To do so can affect the conscience of other believers and those who are weaker. Living such lifestyles can cause others to stumble. When they see us and they hear us and they know we are doing these things, it can cause them to stumble. Am I saying, let me just put it out there before anybody kind of wants to trust them. Marilyn, I have two children and I have grandchildren. I have nieces and nephews and friends. And I'm not telling you as I stand here before God and before you, if they invite me to their party, I'm not going to go. I'm going. Yeah, let me tell you. So if you see me there, I've told you. I'm going. But when I go there, brethren, I'm light. And I'm salt. I'm light. And I'm salt. My testimony still stands. You won't catch me doing all manner of things. And then coming into the house of the Lord. I will go. But I know who I am. I know who I represent. I'm representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when they see me, they say, yes, I remember when she just broke out upon the dance floor. Yes, I remember that one you used to smoke. Yes, I remember that one you used to go to the blues. Yes, I remember she used to take drugs. Yes, I remember her. But look at her now. That must be our testimony. So I'm not saying not to go. But be wise because you are enlisted in the army. You are a soldier in the army of God. 
Don't go AWOL. Glory be to God. Let us not get entangled with the things of the world that can easily be said to us. But let's look to Jesus, who is the author and the finish of our faith. And in conclusion, Paul lays down the rule for Christian conduct in verse 31. He says, in eating and in drinking, and all we do, we should aim at the glory of God and pleasing and honour him. This is my first part of the, the title of the message, to the glory of God. This is the fundamental practice of godliness. Nothing should be done by us to offend anyone, whether Jew, Gentile, or the church. Our humour and appetite must not determine our practice, but the honour of God and the good and edification of the church. We should not so much consult our own pleasures. Do not seek our own pleasures and interests. But we are to be sold out for the advancement of the kingdom of God among men. In all that we do, we are to glorify God. In all that we pursue, we are to glorify God. Our lifestyle should be ones that are pleasing in all our ways to the glory of God. Verse 33, Paul says, and he ends the chapter appealing to his own example. He says, he is not guided by personal advantage, but consideration for the good of many, specifically their salvation. Brethren, our lifestyle should be ones that win our unsaved loved ones to the Lord. That should be our desire for their salvation. He calls on the Corinthian Christians as he calls on the church of God today to imitate him. And the reason we should do so is because Paul imitates Christ. His example points to Jesus Christ, the Savior. The question that I leave with us this morning is, can this be said of you and I? Are we pointing others to Jesus? Do our lifestyles and choices that we make emulate Jesus? Are we living our lives to the glory of God? And so in ending this morning's message, I leave you with the title of the sermon, which is, Be Wise for Conscience Sake to the Glory of God. God bless you.